Well, hi there and welcome along to Jump To It, brought to you by irishracing.com. Coming up on today's show, well, we've got a plethora of action, haven't we? We'll be taking a close look at Goodwood, New Market, Windsor, not forgetting the current as well. It's all going on. And as always, discuss all matters horse racing. I'd like to bring in Stephen Harris and Vincent Finnegan. Great to see you then, gentlemen. Uh, Stephen, how's your week been? You've been keeping busy. Yeah, it's been a really busy week, high to the summer, Ed, isn't it? We had an absolute deluge in the south for about six hours the other day, and that did change the ground briefly. Uh, I know at uh, Newmarket, uh, we're recording this on Thursday, they're currently soft ground, so have to have a good weather watch this week. And I mean, the forecast now looks sunny in 23, 24 degrees, so I would imagine it's going to dry out rapidly. By the time we get round to the races we're talking about today, I'd have thought it'd be good ground again, drying out all the time. Yeah, that's the tricky imponderable, I suppose, uh, in many respects. I was actually hearing a few of the new market connections were saying, I think they had 60 millimetres of rain in a day and mm. uh, jockeys were pouring water out their riding boots and all sorts. Yeah, absolute carnage. They hadn't seen a drop for three months. So, as you say, officially soft on a lot of the uh, GB race courses anyway at the time of recording, but set fair for around 20 degrees in sun. So it could be that, that dreaded tacky ground, uh, which the trainers mm. like to get in as an excuse early doors. As someone who's never making excuses, Vincent Finnegan, <laughs> um, great to see you again. Now, last week we, we spoke about there was some pretty good racing uh, in Ireland um, at the at the Curra. Of course, we've got the Curra again this week. Uh, Aesop's Fables got the job done in the Futurity Stakes and uh, Meditate, you said, was pretty much the banker of the weekend, uh, obliged in the debutante stakes. Uh, what do you make of those two, Aidan O'Brien Hot Pots, uh, with a view to next year's classics? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Aidan O'Brien has such a, has such a wealth of horses. That's the, that's the issue, isn't it? He probably has a whole load of them, haven't even raced yet, that could be classic contenders for next season. But Meditate looks very, very good, and Aesop's Fable, that was some performance for a horse that was drifting in the betting. There was no real confidence behind it. The money was all for Dunica's horse in the same race. So that, that was a very good performance. Um, it's been interesting here in Ireland now. We've got the Curras on this weekend on Saturday. It's the fourth Saturday in a row the Curras on. The going is good, good to firm in places. We haven't had the rain you've had in the UK. We've missed we've missed that mostly anyway. Some of the West Coast got some earlier in the week. But for this weekend, we have the current. It's good, good to firm in places. They're still watering the track and we're due fine weather. So it's, um, they're racing on the middle track as well because we've got big, a big meeting coming up on the current in a few weeks' time, Irish Champions Weekend. So the Sunday of that will be in the current. The Saturday's in Leopardstown for the Irish Champion Stakes where we're hoping Bayeed might turn up. Possibility, mm -hmm. which would be... Wow, I think over here, I think at this stage, the horses at superstar status, it'd be incredible to see a horse of that caliber coming now. I think you'd get a big, big uh, crowd if he comes. Oh, I was to say, absolutely. The, it, it seemed after Baid won at York, it was kind of straight to champion stakes uh, at Ascot and then retirement. Well, you know, there's there's glimmers of light, aren't they? The, 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 the carrot's been dangled, potentially Irish champion. We all want to see him in the arc, don't we? Uh, you now they're now not totally ruling out. I mean, we live in hope and prepare for disappointment, I suppose, is the bottom line. But yeah, we want to see Baid. We want more Baid. Absolutely scintillating when taking a, a part of the field in the Jumont International. Anyway, to more pressing matters, we have a action-packed show, lots to cover. So let's look ahead to our races of the week. Well, I mentioned uh, we're looking at all sorts of different action this week. And we're going to kick off at Goodwood in the 150, our first port of call uh, for the prestige Philly Stakes Group 3 action here. That kind of niche trip of seven furlongs uh, for the two-year-olds. I say at the time of recording on uh, Friday morning, officially soft ground, but with sun to come. So that's going to confuse things a little bit, isn't it, Stephen? I mean, that's going to be fairy cross. Uh, on official ratings, a bit in hand, is she the one you want to side with here? Well, I think this is probably a no bet race, even regardless of the um, the ground we don't know about. I mean, you'd, you'd have to think it's going to dry out, Ed, wouldn't you? 48 hours away, sunshine forecast. Goodwood is a bit of a punting minefield at the best of times. Of course, in the old days, we used to have Seamus, who used to water it shamelessly in August. So he said he described it as shameless, good, good to firm. And it, was all, it was always good to soft anyway. Uh, and soft ground at Goodwood is not my idea of a brilliant punting meeting. But if it dries out, let's assume it's going to be nearly good. You'd hope so. I, I like Carl Burke's filly here, Bright Diamond. Um, she's around about five to one. Uh, it's all about potential, really. Carl Burke's had a brilliant season. 
especially with juveniles. He's had six winners in the last fortnight. They're flying along. Every time they have a bet, they seem to win or go very close. And, and Bright Diamond was a, a double-figure price for her debut at Newmarket. Uh, and she did it well. I mean, she was green enough early on, but she picked up smartly. And, and Carl Burke isn't one of these trainers. He doesn't run many 50-to-1 chances. He's not, he's not going to places to get the owner's badges and stuff. And he knows what he's got at home. And I think Bright Diamond's a very exciting prospect. Now, whether or not you want to back her, if the ground's soft, it's a complete unknown, we're guessing, aren't we? And, and these Phillies races at this time of year in particular are a bit of a minefield. But I thought she was the most interesting runner. Bright Diamond, uh, Clifford Lee and Carl Burke. Uh, anything for yourself in this one, Vincent? Well, the first thing to note with that Bright Diamond is we have no idea how good or bad that form is. She goes and wins nine lengths on debut, but it was a six-runner race. They were all newcomers and none of them have run since. She's going to be the first to have run since from that race, so we have no idea what the other five are like. So beating them nine lengths means not a lot at this minute in time. Uh, the other thing is the ground. Um, if you're interested in Fairy Cross, which has to have a chance, six lengths um, clear of the third when second in a listed race at Sandown the last day, it's out of a fast company mare, so soft ground won't be an issue if it turns out to be soft ground. Um, the other one here, the top one beat me. Um, also, one here on debut on soft ground that was over six, uh, disappointed a little bit the last day, but just with the soft ground being the issue, very few of these have raced on it, but Fairy Cross should go on it if it turns out to be soft and the top horse has won on soft ground before which is somewhat interesting yeah i think it's that type of race isn't it it's a bit of a race of split opinions because there are quite a few unknowns but i was going to give the nod here to john quinn's philly breach who i thought looked an absolute superstar admittedly when she won a minor race at weatherby on debut but she took the field apart that day there was talk of royal ascot etc etc uh she's underwhelmed a little bit since but i do think this step up to seven could be key here on a slightly slower ground she got going far too late over six last time at Ascot, so interesting stepping up to seven uh, for me there. That's horse number two on your cards, Breege, uh, in the 150. Right, we're moving on. We'll go on to the three o'clock, uh, which is a race which has been giving us a little bit of a chuckle in a cynical kind of way off air here, isn't it? It's the March Stakes, Group 3, £57,000 uh, to the winner. The, the race ran in memory of the late John Dunlop, uh, and we've got, we've got four runners. Uh, one of number four was on poke, or there or thereabouts, in Who Your Mouth, of course, uh, runner-up in the Epsom Derby. And, um, well, we got a bit of amusement here, Vincent, haven't we, with a, a 250 to one poke looking to cause a bit of a stir. Yeah, I think so. I think this is great. I think John O'Neill, he, he deserves credit for this, the trainer. This filly, she only cost a thousand, thousand euro. And she's run seven times. She's barely beaten a rival on all seven starts. Um, I think she's finished last several times or beaten one home on a few of those runs. She's she's obviously very poor. Uh, even her rating of 64 looks to flatter her somewhat. But the great thing here is he has her in a group three. She's going to get black type for finishing fourth at worst. And she picks up £5,360 for her troubles going over there, which more than covers the expenses. I think it's a terrific idea from John O'Neill. He's he's landed on his feet here. This will be um, a right return for them for a very, very poor mare. And uh, she, she, she's going to be a million miles behind Hula Yamal and the rest of them. I, I can't see. Um, I can't see how the favourite gets beat here. But having said that, the favourite gets beat almost every time. It's not, it's not a winning horse, but the second in the derby is the standout piece of form, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point you make. Uh, and Stephen, it's, it's very hard to get involved in a race like this, bluntly, isn't it? I mean, if you look on ratings, who your mouth's got £18 in the hand of perfect alibi, talking over two stone um, animato would be getting from who your mouth in a handicap. But there is just something in the back of me, maybe I'm clutching at straws, that who your mouth, uh, for win purposes, is there just a little bit of a quirk with this individual? Yeah, I mean, you'd, uh, the ground would be a, a concern. Who Yamal did run on heavy first time out of Sandown last season and ran OK. Um, but, you know, you're not sure if it is going to be soft ground or good soft. The, the trip's a slight unknown. I would imagine stay no problem at all. Ran really well in the Gordon. That form's been Frank Doville legend come out and bolted up at York. So clear on form. I mean, I suppose perfect alibi will lead on its own. Uh, could take a bit of passing if it's a tactical race, uh, but it's a really disappointing tenner. It's, it's a shame to be negative because Huey Mal's a really nice horse, £1.2 million they paid uh, for him. Um, but 
it's disappointing, Ed, isn't it? On a Saturday afternoon, we've got three and a half runners really here for a race of this nature uh, in the middle of the ITV programming. It's not a great advert, and that is the way we're going at the moment. It, it's sort of slippery slope and racing sliding rapidly off it. Yeah, it seems to be a, a sense of uh, Groundhog Day to that conversation, doesn't there? But yeah, it is a disappointing turnout. There's no other way you can dress it up. I mean, who are your mouths, you say? Bought out of Andrew Baldings for north of a million, I think with a view of in it going to Hong Kong and going globetrotting uh, for new connections later in the season. Should be a formality on paper, as you say, just not really a race which uh, entices you in. Uh, from a betting perspective, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, on to the three thirty-five, the celebration mile. Now, this is a this is an in interesting encounter. We've only got the five runners, but we got some uh, some interesting prospects here. Um, Mustabek uh, leads the market. Best price eleven to ten at the time of recording. Uh, Charlie Hills and Jim Crowley teaming that with individ that individual, of course, who was went down on the line uh, against Chindit last time out. Ascot uh, Jadumi. Uh, for Will Buick and the Christopher team, 7-2, 11-2 Escobar, 15-2 Finest Sound, and the veteran Stormy Antarctic, uh, around 10-1 to 1 or there or thereabouts. Uh, Stephen, you getting involved in this one? I think this is very trappy. I mean, the top one, Escobar, who I see is around 6 or 7 to 1. Surely that's far too short. I don't fancy that in a race of this nature at all. Um, the favourite, I think he's clear on form. Um whether or not getting out battled by Chindit is fantastic form in itself. And he's had one run at Goodwood previously in this race and finished eighth of nine. So that's a slight negative. He wouldn't be worried about soft ground. I think that's one thing to say in his favour. Uh, he was a good winner at Thirsk on testing ground earlier in the season. I think this is a really, really trappy race. When I was looking at it, the favourite was sort of eight to 11, four to five with the firms. And I was thinking, well, that's a very short price given that he's you know he's well beaten one run at Goodwood chinned it's been stuffed since he beat him um but he has gone out I think he's now sort of 2.3 11 to 8 something like that on the exchange so he's going to be an uneasy sort of Saturday favorite I thought this was really tough I, I haven't got a strong opinion Ed unusually what did you like um, exactly the same. Um, Splint is in my backside. Mm. I'm, I'm sat firmly on the fence for this one. I think Jadumi would definitely handle conditions. There was plenty of cut in the ground at Chester last time out. And I think yeah. one in France in an absolute swamp. As you say, it's kind of the horse who's uh, been clocking good numbers without winning, uh, taking on perhaps horses who've been coming through the ranks and are coming up to meet him. And all in all, it's a bit of a head scratcher. Maybe Vincent, he will have some conviction on this assignment. No, none. There's uh, only six pounds <laughs> between the five of them here, so it's it's very difficult. Like, look, the favourite's the most likely winner. It goes on the ground. The chinded form is probably a good run in Ascot. But having said that, there's only six pounds between them, and they're not all real winning machines here. The outsider of the field, Stormy Atlantic, is one that if the ground did turn out to be pretty soft, it's a five-time winner on soft or heavy ground. So that, that's a key to that horse, but it is a veteran at this stage at nine years of age. So I, I'd be staying out unless you, maybe if you saw a bit of six to four, the favourite, maybe it's worth a little punt. But otherwise, no. Yeah, indeed. Another bit of a head scratcher on the Goodwood card. I think it's fair to say. Nonetheless, it is intriguing. Right, we'll head over to headquarters uh, for the 3.15 the hopeful stakes listed contest here. 11 runners due to go to post for this six furlong assignment. Now, I mentioned at the top of the show, it's 60 millimetres of rain in, in Newmarket. So even allowing for a bit of sun, it sounds like they got the uh, the upper end of the rain, if you like. And I imagine there'll be a bit of juice in the ground uh, by the time they go to post. Uh, and again, Stephen, this is a, on paper a bit of a wide open encounter. Great ambassador a seven to two market leader, um, but you can kind of make a case of at least half the field in this, I thought. Yeah, it's quite a competitive race. Um, we've got last year's winner, Summerhand, um, who yep. won at York as well last weekend. So he's in good form. The only thing with Summerhand is that if you look at all his runs, they're all on all of his winning form and good forms on good fast ground. He's run three times on soft and been well beaten. So that would be a negative. And one thing to say about Newmarket, Ed, I mentioned Seamus earlier at Goodwood, who's now retired, thankfully. We've got Michael Prosser at HQ. Now, he doesn't mind chucking a load of water. I watched Newmarket at the last meeting. They're finishing like Foss last. It's supposed to be good to firm. It definitely wasn't good to firm. So if he's been watering and they've had all this rain, it could be. it's not guaranteed to dry out there. So I would be slightly uh, careful and watch the early races, maybe see how bad it is. But I, I do like Manakan here, who's got... One good run on good to soft ground at Newmarket. So that shouldn't be too much of an issue. 
um, we talked a lot on um, Jump to It about handicappers coming up into listed and group company. I don't mind, especially with sprinters, if they're in form, there's no difference to me that these top Saturday handicaps and sort of group three listed contests, if they're in form and they handle conditions in the track, I'm not worried about it. And you do get quite decent prices because people pigeonhole horses as handicappers. And I think they've done that with Manakan, who's seven to one. And if you watch that Ascot win back um, the other weekend, lots went wrong for Manakan. He was going really well. He had them all covered at halfway, but he couldn't get out. Eventually, he did get out, and he won really readily. Uh, and Ascot, uh, I think the form's perfectly solid enough, and I think he'll go really close again with any luck in running. He, he does need luck in running. He's going to be held up. Hayley Turner's up, but I don't think he'll be far away if he sees any daylight late. Interesting. Manakan there for John Ryan, Hayley Turner. And that three roll, as Stephen says, priced around seven to one. Uh, Vincent, for you... Um, what do you like in this one? Yeah, I thought it's tricky enough. I quite like the top horse, uh, Great Ambassador. That was one for me. It's met Summerhand three times, beat it each time. It was six in the Stewart's Cup. Uh, it was also third in that race last year on softish ground. That's the only run it really has on soft ground that's of any note. Um, I'd see they taken it out on heavy ground before because of the going. So you wouldn't want it too soft, perhaps, for Great Ambassador. But I just thought that there's a, there's a squeak there. I, I like the form. I think it's solid enough, even though the form figures of 076 don't look appealing. But they're in, they're in decent company. And I wouldn't be surprised to see that involved. I wouldn't put anyone off Stephen's suggestion either. Um, the ground is, is going to be the key, most likely. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the ground could hold the key to this, which is why um, I'm splitting the opinion even more here. I thought Vad Dream was very interesting for Charlie Fellows. The yard are on fire at the moment. Uh, young Harry Davis, do very little wrong this season, is in the saddle. Uh, Vad Dream, recent form has been woeful. However, uh, a Group 3 winner on soft. The cheap piece has gone for the first time. Say in this company, on official ratings, it is right in the mix here. So again, at around 7-1, to one, I wouldn't be shocked if that filly... Uh, came back to something like her best form. But it is that type of race, isn't it? It's a it's a trappy old encounter. And uh, nonetheless, uh, opinions are split on the panel. Right, uh, we'll go over to Windsor, 6.35. Uh, the Winter Hill Stakes, a group three action here on the cards, over 10 furlongs, seven runners due to go to post here for this assignment. Grocer Jack, six to four market leader uh, for the outrageously informed William Haggis. Uh, with Tom Marcond in the saddle. Uh, the one to beat here, Stephen, or do you think this is a bit of a false favourite? No, I thought it was the right favourite. Haggis absolutely flying. We've said, haven't we, for about the last, seems like the last two years, talking about flat racing, yeah. how his strike rate is well over 30%, and everything they back wins. I mean, they just knows the time of day. It places his horse is absolutely brilliant. Now, the one exception to that was Grocer Jack last time out in the Rose of Lancaster at uh, Haydock. 11 to 8 favourite, absolute pounds, shillings and pence job, and bumped into one, I thought. Didn't do a lot wrong. Um, softish ground at the moment at Windsor. Surely that would have dried out given the weather forecast. You'd think you'd be back near a good, but a bit of cut in the ground. No problem at all for Manikan. Ran really well at Shanti earlier in the summer. So I thought uh, Grocer Jack, beg your pardon, I thought Grocer Jack sets a clear standard on form, likely to get a positive ride, no messing about. Um, I see he's got an entry in the... Uh, Kripko, Champions Day, Ascot in October. So Haggis obviously holds him in high regard. He's going to keep on improving. He's five, but he's not had a lot of racing as his stamina has drawn out. And I, I thought he was a worthy favourite. He has got down to about six to four, which is I certainly wouldn't want to take less, but uh, I thought he was the standout contender. Absolutely. Uh, I'm happy to swerve this one as well. Uh, Vincent, for yourself? Oh, I, I tend to fall for these all the time. I think Grosser Jack will win. Um, I think he's reasonable odds at six to four. But having said that, he was disappointing for me the last day. Again, when he did finish second the last day, he still had one of these rivals, Royal Champion, two and a quarter lengths behind. So the level of form is probably very good. Uh, Majestic Dawn was the other one, beating a short head in Deauville in a group three the last day. That, that definitely has a chance against it. But outside of that, I don't think the rest of them should pose a threat to the top horse, Grosser Jack. Indeed, so quite a lot of uh, confidence behind Grocer Jack then for the uh, William Haggis team. Yeah, you're right, Stephen. Uh, 31% strike rate since the start of July. That's the only stats I've got to my, to my mind. But yeah, essentially, for seems for infinity now that Yard have been uh, in top gear with Tom Marcond uh, riding the majority of them as well, it seems. So um, yeah, f f fantastic season for the William Haggis team. And you get the feeling it's not ended yet. Right, now we'll get over the Irish Sea. Off to the Curra. Mentioned earlier, Vincent, we've got the Round Tower Stakes at 2.30. Uh, 
in the Irish Cambridgeshire at 4.15, the, the two key races we're focusing on here. So uh, the dance floor is yours. Yeah, it's an interesting day. Again, as I said earlier, it's the fourth meeting, four weeks in a row at the Curra, so the ground is probably getting a bit churned a little bit, even though it's quick ground. Um, no rain due, good to firm is probably what we're going to be looking at. It's good at the moment, good to firm in places. They are watering, but you'd imagine we're due a dry spell. There's no sign of any particular rain coming. So we're looking at something that's going to be good, good to firm-ish in ground. And the Cambridgeshire, this is an interesting race, most interesting. First of all, it's sponsored by Paddy Power. These big handicaps tend to be sponsored by bookmakers. And it's no surprise when you see there hasn't been a favourite winning this race for 20 years. Sorry, we're, we're showing the graphic for the other one, the 230, the Round Tower Stakes, but I've started off talking about the Cambridgeshire. Um, so anyway, I'll carry on about the Cambridgeshire. We've had no favourite in 20 years. I think part of the reason for this is, I've had a look at this, and they tend to put three-year-olds in as the favorite in this big handicap each year. So for the last five years, a three-year-old has been favorite. This year, there are three three-year-olds vying for favoritism, Janubi, Cowboy Justice, and Good Heavens. And again, maybe that's the problem here. Three-year-olds can't beat the older horses at this stage of the year in these sort of handicaps. You've got the old hardened handicappers are better at it, and the other ones are probably slightly overrated, some of these three-year-olds, because they're rapidly improving. So. Maybe that's the reason we haven't had a favourite win in so long. Um, in the particular race, I, I fancy one here. I think there's a horse here is a wrong price and a wrong price for several reasons. Um, a horse called Fastnet Crown, trained by Michael O'Callaghan. It was third in this race last year. On top of that, it was a course and distance winner here in June. Has some very good form at the Curra. And you see the duck egg the last day. That was last of 18 in the BMW handicap at Galway. But there was a, an issue that day. The, the horse... The saddle slipped back soon after leaving stall, so you can draw a line through that. Fastnet Crown started 8-1 to one for that race in Galway. Big handicap worth even more than this. It was a £120,000 handicap, that one in Galway. This is a £100,000 handicap, same distance. Um, the Galway race is always very competitive, but Fastnet Crown was one of the favourites for that, despite having a wide draw and stalled 13, and then the saddle slipped. So you can ignore that. It started 8-1 to one that day. There's several of these ran in that race as well. So I, I think Fastnet Crown is the wrong price here, to be honest with you. Um, has very good form overall. Third in the race last year. I'd be disappointed if that's not in the first six, which you can get at the 20 to 1 with Paddy Power and Betfair at the moment. Um, and then if we move on to the other... Yeah. If we move on to the other race, the Round Tower Stakes, which is a group three over six furlongs for two-year-olds. Um, it looks like the Phillies are going to dominate this, which is a bit unusual, perhaps. But we've got uh, Treasure Trove is the one that's most likely going to win. I thought it would probably win. Um, it beat Rocket Rodney last week in a listed race at York. Paddy Toomey's horses are in unbelievable form. Presuming all goes well for um, the only thing. The only little question here is the step up to six. Shouldn't be a problem. She was storming home in York the last day over five. So you'd expect you'd expect her to win here. The other ones that that definitely count are Ocean Quest, which was third in a, a big sales race at Nace the last day, um, and it had two of these behind that day. Uh, Apricot Twist and Coralillo were both behind in that. Then we've got a filly of Aidan O'Brien's Dower House. Took three goals to win a maiden, but was impressive enough the last day. And then Lady Tilbury, which has had lots of experience, mid division in the Queen Mary, beaten three and a half lengths in the Louder at York as well. Um, of the Colts, the only one there is there's one called Damber Diplomat. Um, the form of its current win was franked only yesterday by a horse called Sue Spirit, which won well in Navin. And uh, so may maybe that'd have a squeak. But for, for me, the likely winner there is Treasure Trove. So that's the, the, the two main races mm. at the Curra anyway summed up. We've got good racing all afternoon, to be honest with you, at the Curra. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a group three action there on the car. So I was just going to mention, yeah, Paddy Toomey, we seem to be... Uh, Pretty much in the in the fan club here, don't we? Uh, on last week's show, we thought, oh, maybe uh, Trish Trove has a bit to find on the Knaves Mire Blatt on ratings and there. Uh, Pulled and never out of the hat. Uh, we say we're talking about Detroit rates. Someone else, wasn't he? he was, uh, I think you called up the stats last week, but uh, he's really having a season to remember. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. And I think you'll see a lot more of him now before the season's over. He's got lots of contenders for big races to come. He's got some really good fillies, that Lapete Coco, uh, which was a Group 1 winner at the Curra not so long ago, and that Ross Carberry, which um, was placed in a Group 1 race in France last week as well. He's He's got horses everywhere, and they're all really good. Small string, but they nearly all win, and he's got a very high calibre of horse, which is unusual for a small enough yard in Ireland. Wonderful stuff. Right, brilliant. That pretty much wraps up the... 
the weekend action previews. Now it's time to nail the colours to the Masters always with our best tips of the week. Right then, Stephen. Uh, last week's show, we we kind of hit the crossbar and out a little bit. With John Leeper at least collected the, uh, the each way money at a big price in the e ball. Um, previously to that, you were unstoppable. Uh, can we get back to that winning thread again uh, this week? What have you got for us? Yeah, actually, John Leeper, Ed, I thought was going to win for most of that race. He was in the perfect spot. I don't think I've ever seen him so close. And he actually wilted in the final 100 yards, which surprised me. But he is an expensive horse to follow, but at least he scrambled into the frame. Uh, this weekend, obviously, it's complicated with the going. I've sort of assumed it's going to dry back out to good. My three are my betting expert naps in the 315 at Newmark. already touched upon Manikarn, a progressive sprinter from a small yard. I think you're getting a decent price because he's coming up from handicaps to listed class. He's run well at Newmarket before and with a bit of cut in the ground. Hayley Turner, hopefully weave her way through late. Uh, my betting expert value angle selection runs at Beverly in the 130. Now, up north, they've missed this rain. Beverly's good ground still. And I like Outrun the Storm, who's a progressive front runner. I like front runners at Beverly on fast ground. It looks like Oisinor should be able to get the lead and keep pulling out more. Um, he's been harried in small fields the last twice and run really well. And I think there's more to come from him. And my long shot runs at Goodwood in the 225. Um, Sir Dance a lot. Uh, John Butler, a very shrewd stable. Uh, interesting jockey booking here, Jim Crowley. I think Sir Dancelot's going to be a huge price. He ran disappointing last time, but I think there was an excuse. In his previous second at Pontefract, um, was quite eye-catching. He represented a big return to form, and I think he's been overlooked a bit, Sir Dancelot. He's not getting any younger like all of us, but with Jim Crowley books, I think he could go close. Fantastic. Three of the best from Stephen Harris there on this week's show. Uh, Vincent, for yourself, please. Yeah, I'm going to stick to the curra. It's what I know. And we know that there's no issue with the ground. It's going to be goodish ground, quick enough ground. So my nap I'm going to go for is Treasure Trove. Uh, we've just talked about her only a few minutes ago. Um, Treasure Trove, big big chance in the round tower stakes. That's at the half two at the curra on Saturday. And um, you just presume that the effect of going to York and back won't, won't affect her here. Um, the step up to six should suit. I'd be surprised if she's not involved and she should hopefully win. Then for the value bet, I'm going for a horse here called Ice Cold and Alex. It runs in the 305, a handicap over six furlongs. Now, Ice Cold and Alex, the reason I'm going here for value is because there's a horse likely to start favourite in this called Sunset Nova. Has good form coming into the race. But when you look at the current form for Sunset Nova, it's zero from 10 at the track. Doesn't seem to like the like the track at all. I think it's only been placed once or twice out of 10 goes at the Curra. Whereas on the other hand, Ice Cold and Alex is a three-time course winner. Would probably prefer seven furlongs as the optimum trip, but it has won over as, as short as five at the Curra. Oh, on overall form, I think Ice Cold and Alex has a squeak here against um, the field. And I just think if you're, if you're having a bet in it, I'd be staying away from Sunset Nova because of its Curra form. Um, and then the long shot I'm going to go for is Fast Neck Crown and the big one, the Paddy Power. Irish Cambridgeshire, I think 20 to 1 is a wrong price. Uh, as I said before, it was third in the race last year, and you can ignore the run the last day when the saddle slipped. Wonderful, wonderful. We have 20, look out for that 20 to 1 poke on the Irish Cambridgeshire now. I'm going to be uh, locked into watching that assignment. Uh, as for myself, yeah, I'm pretty much concentrating on, on Goodwood here. Uh, Breeze would be my nap. Uh, I just think this filly's been crying out for seven furlongs. Watch your last two starts over six. Uh, it just gets going far too late. So seven furlongs, hopefully, the answer there for Breeze in the prestige fillies. Uda Lally uh, for Andrew Balding and William Buick has four figures at Goodwood of a first and a second. And we know this is a, a track with its quirks, its idiosyncrasies. If you like Goodwood, you like Goodwood, if you see what I'm saying. And I just think this horse, uh, it's too early to say it's a cool specialist, but clearly enjoys it here and does have plenty of good form uh, when there's juice in the ground. So... I don't think there'll be any excuses for Uda Valley or thought could run well at around eight to one. Uh, Vadrim mentioned earlier, this horse is uh, well, one on debut on the weather. Since then, has only managed to notch up one win and that came in a group three on soft ground. So if conditions don't dry out too much, uh, I think that individual could go well at around seven to one with Harry Davis on board. You know, one of the, uh, the stars of the season in the saddle. So all in all, it's going to be fast and furious, and it should be good fun on Saturday. Right, before we go, uh, Vincent, I'll come to you. Uh, you got much planned for the weekend? 
Oh, I'm going visiting daughters. That's my job this weekend. Got to go up to Dublin to see the two daughters. So we're going out to dinner with them on uh, tomorrow night, Saturday evening. That's the plan there. And there's no racing in Ireland on Sunday, which is a bit unusual, but you're no harm for that. Uh, it'll be a nice, quiet weekend, I'm hoping. I was going to say, what, 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 what's your Sunday gone in store? Are you going to mow the lawn or um, feet up? or? Um... Fortunately, my wife mowed the lawn yesterday, so I'm clear of that for this weekend. I, I we, we might just go up to the pub and have a little pint of Guinness at some point in the afternoon. That'd be a nice thought. I was going to say, that sounds a much more enjoyable alternative. Uh, and Stephen, yourself? Yeah, watch a bit of cricket, uh, sit in the garden. The last few barbecues, I think, coming up here, aren't we, Rick? We're heading towards the jump season. I saw you on Twitter earlier, nine weeks till the Cheltenham meeting. Um, that's amazing, isn't it? But I mean, it's been a fantastic eight. summer. Oh, eight. Oh, God. I mean, it's been such a fantastic <laughs> counting, summer. Yeah. The weather's been wonderful almost every weekend. So make the most of it. I think we'll, we'll soon have the heating on or, or perhaps more accurately have our wives chopping the uh, wood to keep the fire going this winter by the look of things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Uh, lots of things to look forward to, shall we say. But you are right. Yeah, it's eight weeks today, uh, Cheltenham's October meeting. Not that I'm counting down the uh, hours or anything. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm off. For, well, I think we're, we're both off for a little break, aren't we, Stephen? So um, yeah. I think Vincent might be steering the ship next week or uh, words to those effect. But anyway, it's been a pleasure, gents. Um, should, best luck with all your selections. Thank you for watching at home. Um, of course, don't forget to check out all the Stephen's tips on a daily basis on bettingexpert.com and check out all the latest news and features and the headline of a, what will be Vincent's 20 to 1 winning Irish Cambridgeshire tip uh, on the website as well, of course. So do keep in touch with all things racing on irishracing.com. Please do gamble responsibly. Enjoy your weekend. We'll do it again next week. Bye for now.